Hello viewers, thank you for joining Alpha One Canada's 2015 Virtual Education Summit. My name is Duncan Lam and I'll be your host. We're very happy and grateful to have our speaker here today, Dr. Marsha Spivak from Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga, Ontario. Dr. Spivak will be speaking to us about the genetics of Alpha One antitrypsin deficiency. Dr. Spivak, I'll let you say a few words to our viewers before we begin your presentation. Do you mind sharing with us your experience and areas of expertise? Uh, sure, thank you, Duncan. My educational background is in human genetics. I have a PhD from the University of Ottawa and postdoctoral training in clinical laboratory genetics at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. I am certified in um, clinical cytogenetics and molecular genetics at the, uh, I obtained certification from um, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario through the uh, training program at the Canadian College of Medical Genetics. In 1998, I accepted a position at Credit Valley Hospital, which is now a part of Trillium Health Partners in Mississauga. Our genetic uh, laboratory helps to support testing for many genetic-based disorders in the Mississauga and Brampton area, as well as um, many parts of Ontario. The type of tests that we do include helping to diagnose and determine treatments for disorders such as cancer, as well as gene sequencing for familial uh, genetic um, diseases. The genotyping of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was one of the first molecular tests that we uh, started up at the lab. Our lab is one of only three in Canada that perform this test. So my plan today is to give a brief overview about genetics and then discuss specifically the genetics of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Spivak. Well, without further ado, let's proceed to today's featured presentation. Genetics in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The first part of this presentation will be a brief discussion about DNA and how it is organized in the cell. I will next explain genetic variation and how some differences in DNA can be harmless and how other differences can cause a genetic disorder. Finally, I will talk about SERPNA1, the gene responsible for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. DNA is the basis of life for almost all living things other than some viruses. All the cells in our bodies contain the DNA that we inherited from our parents. The DNA is highly organized physically in structures known as chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, including the sex chromosomes, which determine whether we are born male or female. Each chromosome contains hundreds of genes. Our chromosomes and our DNA are contained in the nucleus of each cell. So what does DNA do? DNA contains the instructions for the functioning of the cells of our bodies. Since DNA is stuck in the nucleus, it can only get its instructions out to the rest of the cell by sending a message. This message is known as messenger RNA. Messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and heads into the cytoplasm where it is translated into the corresponding protein. If there is an error in the DNA, the error will be in the message, and the end result is that the protein may not be made correctly. To explain this more fully, I would like to use the analogy of a library. One way to think about how DNA is organized in the cell is to imagine that the genes are instructional books in a library. There are about 20,000 genes in the human genome, so imagine the library contains 20,000 books, and there are just two copies of each book in this particular library. The gene sequences are like sentences that provide the instructions for making protein, which carries out the work of the cell. 
Imagine further that each of the two books in the library is a different edition. The two copies of each gene in the genome are like two editions of the same book. In genetics, the different copies of each gene are called alleles. Alleles can be normal or abnormal. Normal alleles are like different ways of spelling the same word within a sentence, similar to the difference between British and American spelling for some words. The different normal alleles are similar enough that they are basically correct, despite the minor differences. However, an abnormal allele is like a word that is so poorly spelled that the original meaning of the sentence is lost. This is a karyotype. The karyotype shows what chromosomes look like at about a thousand times through a light microscope. They have been treated chemically so that we can recognize them easier and organize them according to their size and pattern. Cytogenetics is the field of science that examines chromosomes. This is a photomicrograph of a normal male. This takes us to the gene for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This gene is located on chromosome 14 and is called serpin A1. There is just one copy of serpin A1 on each chromosome 14. One is inherited from one's father and the other copy is inherited from one's mother. So each of us naturally has two copies of serpin A1. How well our cells make alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is a protein, depends upon the instructions coming from the two copies of serpin A1 that we inherited. There happen to be many variants or alleles of serpin A1. Some are normal and some are deficient. The deficient alleles are the ones that do not make enough normal alpha-1 antitrypsin for functioning in the body. Deficient variants may be called pathogenic variants or mutations. This picture shows how inheritance works. Randomly, each child will receive one copy of each chromosome from each of her parents. This means that if each parent carries a deficient allele of a particular gene, there would be a one in four chance that the child would inherit both deficient alleles for that particular gene. This is because there is a one in two chance that each parent will contribute a deficient allele to the child. I'd like to take a moment and briefly go over some of the genetic terminology that we use uh, for inheritance. A recessive gene is a gene that requires two deficient alleles to cause the disorder. This means that if there is only one deficient allele, the normal allele produces enough good protein to compensate for the failure of the deficient allele. A dominant gene is a gene that requires just one deficient allele to cause disease. This means that the normal allele just can't compensate for the failure of the defective allele. A co-dominant gene is where both alleles contribute equally to the disease. Although alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is often called a recessive disorder, it is really a co-dominant disorder as each allele contributes equally to the disease. If one has two severely deficient alleles, what the patient will have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. However, if for instance, a person has two mildly deficient alleles, they might produce just enough protein to allow normal functioning and they would not become ill. Now, I'd like to explain the terms that we use about gen genetic variation. A polymorphism is a DNA change that is fairly common and has no real effects. Some examples are hair color, eye color, and different blood groups. Polymorphisms can even be silent and just be DNA sequence changes that don't even alter the protein at all. A variant of uncertain significance is a DNA change that causes a protein change, but we are unsure whether that change is going to be harmful. DNA variation is very common, and each person has thousands of variants in their DNA sequence. 
and it is not always easy to tell if the variant will be harmful. A pathogenic variant, however, is a DNA change that we recognize right away to be harmful to the protein, and we know that it is disease-causing. The cause of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency was discovered before DNA sequencing was routinely available, and as a result, it has some unusual terminology based on the biochemical methods used to describe the mutations in the protein. The normal variants of serpin A1 are typically known as M or PIM. The M alleles produce a normal amount of protein activity. In other words, each M allele can contribute 50% of the total needed. So together, two M alleles would produce 100% of the protein activity needed for normal functioning. Some M alleles do have pro variants in them, but these variants are known to be harmless. The S allele, or PIS, is a mild deficiency allele. Each S allele can contribute about 40% of the alpha-1 antitrypsin needed. So if an S allele is paired with an M allele, the individual will have about 90% of normal activity, and that person will be fine, but they will be a carrier of the mild deficiency allele. On the other hand, the Z allele is a severe deficiency allele that barely produces any activity. So someone with two Z alleles will hardly have any alpha-1 antitrypsin, and even a person with an S and a Z allele will have significant re reduction in alpha-1 antitrypsin activity. Alpha-1 antitrypsin variants can be detected in several ways. The original biochemical method is called PI typing, and this is still in use today, although my laboratory doesn't perform this test. PI typing looks at the alpha-1 antitrypsin protein of the patient and compares the appearance of the protein with a normal control. This is possible because the abnormal proteins each have a particular signature that the biochemist specialist can recognize. The method that we use in my laboratory is called genotyping, and we uh, examine the DNA rather than the protein. We can perform a quick method that only looks for S and Z alleles, and this method is called PCR, or we can sequence the entire serpin A1 gene to look for very rare deficiency alleles that occur throughout the gene as well. Patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency produce lower levels of the protein than normal. The measured activity drops depending upon the severity of the deficiency and whether or not both alleles are affected. The graph on the right shows clearly how the two alleles are additive, so that finally for the PIZZ patient, there may be barely 10% of normal alpha-1 activity measured in the serum. So why is the Z allele so harmful? The Z protein not only doesn't do the job it's meant to do, but it also gets tangled up in clusters called polymers. The Z polymers cause tissue damage and cell death. However, not everyone with a ZZ genotype will have serious liver or lung disease. Other factors will influence this environment as well as unknown genetic factors. There are dozens of different mutations in serpin A1 and dozens of mutations that have been proven to cause alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Null mutations are mutations that produce no protein at all. Although this type of mutation is completely inactive, it isn't as harmful as the Z mutation since there is no accumulation of mutant protein to clog the cells. Many alpha-1 antitrypsin mutations have interesting names. This is because during the very early stages of genetics, specialists preferred to name new mutations after the city where the patient lived. As molecular genetics has developed over time, more precise methods of naming mutations have been created. Current lab laboratory reports should include both the historical name 
and the formal molecular name for any mutation. The Z and S alleles are by far the most common deficiency alleles known. Together, they represent about 80 to 90% of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency cases. Carriership for Z or S is quite high in people of Northern European heritage. The reason for this is unknown. It is possible that there could historically have been some kind of advantage associated with carrying a single deficiency allele that offset the harm of having two deficiency alleles. So what can be done once a genetic diagnosis is made? Well, you can get more information about the genetics of the disease from a, a genetics clinic. In Canada, most university medical schools have genetic specialists and clinics. You can ask your family doctor or specialist for a referral to a geneticist. The geneticist will give the patient an in-depth assessment about their health, family history, and concerns about inheritance of their disorder. One can also inform one's close relatives about the disorder. Knowing about the susceptibility to liver and lung damage can lead to prevention through avoidance of environmental irritants. So in summary, serpin A1 is the gene responsible for producing alpha-1 antitrypsin. Mutations in serpin A1 cause alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. There are many possible different mutations, but Z and S are the most common. The Z mutation has the added problem of forming polymers in the liver, resulting in liver damage. The PIZZ and PISZ um, variants are the most common alpha-1 genotypes, but not everyone will have symptoms. Many other genetic and environmental factors may influence whether a person will become symptomatic. I would like to thank you all for listening to this presentation. I hope I have been able to answer some of your questions regarding the genetic basis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This concludes today's featured presentation. On behalf of Alpha One Canada, I'd like to thank Dr. Spivak for taking the time to prepare and speak to our viewers. I'm sure our viewers have enjoyed the segment. Please continue to check out the rest of our 2015 Virtual Education Summit featured videos on our website, www.alphaonecanada.ca. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.